everybody, Dan Orman, Mike Beer, the DRF race of the day for Saturday, October the 28th. Race number nine at Keeneland. It is the grade two Fayette Stakes. We're going a mile and an eighth on the main track. Let's take a look at this field. It is a big field, Mike, and there's plenty of speed on tap, which means you might want to be looking for a little bit of a late runner. And there are some horses in this race that should offer value that can come from off of the pace. Yeah, I think that's a fair way to evaluate uh, this race, and at least at first pass. I mean, there, it, it feels like, a to me anyway, feels like a really well-matched field. I do think that there are several different ways that you could possibly go in this race. Um, it really does feel like, though, this pace has to be um, at least, you know, close to fast, if not really fast and competitive, um, and that could set it up for a closer. Time Form U.S. believes the pace will be fast, even if the number one film star withdraws from this race and runs in New York as expected. The 12 best actor, if he's going to get to this position, he is really going to have to work from a tough outside post position. He's a good horse. We'll see if he can overcome a fast pace at a mile and an eighth. Yeah, the good news for, for best actor, at least in my opinion, Dan, is I, I don't really see where in his PPs it says that he has to be on the lead to be effective. I mean, they don't got to come out of there running and try to clear this field from the outside post. I'm sure they want to be forward with them, but they don't have to be on an all-out send from out there. Uh, the horse with the best late pace rating from Time Form US is the two, Happy American. You might want to keep an eye on this horse because he rallied for third two starts back in the Stephen Foster. We'll get to him in a second. We'll begin with Film Star, the number one, a horse that is expected to withdraw and run in New York. If he does run here, he's been in very good form for Linda Rice. He draws well and has some tactical speed. All those things are truly. I thought actually Buddy ran pretty well in the Woodward last time, Dan. Um, ultimately got a little tired at the end there, but that pace was solid and he was right up there on it all the way. It sounds like he's not going to run here, but if he does, he's in very good form. Maybe Happy American's the right closer at a gigantic price. His last race over the summer was the Stephen Foster. He caught West Will Power, who was one of the better handicap horses in the country before being retired over a speed track, and he was able to get up for third. They ran him in the Lucas Classic off the layoff, and he just showed no early interest at all in that race. Something tells me it'll be a bit tighter and fresher for this one. Yeah, it's true. Off the your short layoff last time, I mean, I, I don't know what happened there, but he showed zero speed and was never involved. Um, he's got the good news for him. He's got way better races than that. A two-time stakes winner over the winter um, down in at uh, Fairgrounds. And his form after that actually um, stayed really strong all through the summer, Dan. And he just needs the right trip in this race. How about King Fury as a closing chance at a nice price? This horse is a proven commodity at Keeneland. Heck, he won the Lexington over a sloppy Keeneland strip as a three-year-old. That race sort of propelled him into the sort of the second-tier derby, second in the Ohio Derby. Now, maybe he hasn't progressed as much as he's gotten older, but this is the kind of horse going second off of a lengthy layoff that should get the right setup. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it feels like he's one of those horses who never really delivered. He had some really some real early promise, Dan. He, you remember he missed the Kentucky Derby and all the Triple Crown races as a three-year-old. Um, but I actually felt like he was a really interesting part of that crop a couple of years ago, and things just didn't, didn't really go right for him. It's taken him a while. I, I didn't really love his form sort of the second half of last year. I didn't really like any of those races. They gave this horse time off. Maybe he just ran really deceptively well in that race off the layoff, though, Dan. That pace was not fast. He sat last. He made a run through the stretch. He was closest at the finish. Um, I think he could take a step forward in this race with a totally different setup. Giant Game, the number four, is a horse that likes to be up front. He wired them in the Cornhusker over a track that I thought was inside speed favoring, but maybe he has some excuses for his subsequent two defeats. They ran him in the Whitney, and he was in just too tough against a horse that's going to be one of the favorites in the Breeders' Cup Classic, White Barrio. And last time out in the Charlestown Classic, I was stunned that they raided him. I was too. I don't really care about that race. I still, I still think it's fair to question how good this horse actually is, though, Dan. And he really is a horse. When you just start going through all his races, he wants to be forward. Now, if this pace is fast, I think it really works against him. The five Twilight Blue did some good things last time out, considering it was the first time we saw him in over a year, and the fans knew he was going to run well. He took a ton of money despite the layoff, and he ran a very solid second with a good buyer speed figure. So he was obviously ready off the layoff that day. If you think he's going to be sharper second time back, well, he can move up at a price. My one concern is he's another horse that likes to be forwardly placed. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I, again, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt for that last one. You know, he, he matched his top figure. He was off of a very long layoff in that race, but it's also a race where the pace was just super slow early. Dash Attack went to the lead. Twilight Blue went with them. They sat up on the pace together. 
And they just basically sprinted around the final turn and gave the closers no chance in that race. This horse just got a little tired through the stretch. He can build off of it, uh, but can he build off of it if he gets hooked into a faster pace this time? That's the question. Six speed bias uh, took a, a really tough beat in the Pimlico special during the spring where he led every step of the way and just got pipped on the wire by a nice horse in rattle and roll. Now, he hasn't gotten to the winner's circle in his subsequent four starts. I'm willing to forgive that last race from an outside post. He couldn't get to his usual forward position. He's going to show speed in this race. The problem is three or four might show speed as well. Yeah, I thought maybe he was the horse who would be, you know, maybe more intent than anyone else on making the lead in here, Dan. I don't think that's a good thing. And I also will still stand by, um, you know, what I said when we were back at Pimlico on Preakness weekend, the day before on, on Black Eyed Susan Day. I think that was a speed favoring track and this horse took advantage when he ran that uh, 101 buyer. Maybe it's time to start giving the number seven, Il Moroccolo, a little bit of respect. Three-year-old now up against older horses for the first time. Il Moroccolo might have gotten a bad rep because he got, you know, he just got his head handed into him in some of these Kentucky Derby preps. But he won the Smarty Jones two starts back. And last time out in the Pennsylvania Derby, he loomed at the top of the stretch before flattening out against some nice horses. Il Moroccolo is a horse that can sit just off the pace. Yeah, I can see a good trip coming for this horse. And he's clearly improved in his last three races does he have to improve again if he's going to beat this field maybe but maybe not dan it's not like he's meeting a bunch of killers in here i wonder if the eight law professor needed his last race the woodward his first start since the pimlico special a race where he kind of underperformed but maybe after a poor start just didn't have much of a chance over that speed friendly track in the woodward he chased outside i thought he kind of ran in spots was trying at the end yeah. he could take a step forward second start back I'll agree with all that stuff. He could get the right trip in this race too, because he'll he doesn't need to be on the lead to be effective either. He ran fine last time. I didn't think he had, you know, some kind of big excuse in that race. Uh, but he did run well first back from a layoff there. I think it's fair to question, you know, how good he actually is. He's got those two stakes wins earlier this year in Aqueduct where he was just sort of beating really bad fields. But uh, his overall form is, is rock solid. O'Connor rallied for second in the Charlestown Classic, and that's pretty notable considering it's tough to make up a lot of late ground over those tight turns with that short stretch. In the Woodward, he just fell far behind, as he always does. He tried to come with a run. He's going to get a setup. He's getting a little bit of class relief in this race, and he has run some fast races that would make him somewhat competitive. Five to one to me is too light. I agree with you uh, that five to one's too light. I mean, there is a way to look at this horse on paper. Um, I, I just kind of feel like he's not as good as some of those figures make him look. And maybe I'm wrong about that. To me, the Woodward set up perfectly fine for a horse like him with plenty of pace for a closer. And to me, he just didn't run well at all in that spot. I wonder if the number 10 trademark is getting good at just the right time for Vicky Oliver. Just missed a Clapton last time out. That horse is heading to the Breeders' Cup. That was a race at a mile and an eighth where he sat just off of the pace. So he's not a true one-run closer. He's not a speed. He can get the right trip. I agree with that. I think he's pretty interesting in here, Dan. That may be the, that most recent start, the best race he ever run, he's ever run. Um, and he was close. That To me, that was a very solid pace that really helped the closers. And he was right up there the entire way and just got a little tired at the end. This horse ran really well last time. Dash Attacked is another horse that I think is finally about to reach his potential for trainer Kenny McPeak. When he came back in June in that off-turf race, he looked very, very good. And I was somewhat surprised that they decided to stretch him all the way out in the yeah. Birdstone after that performance where he just ran into the best marathoner in the country, Nest. I won't hold the Charlestown Classic against him, those tight turns at the bullring. He broke through last time out. Was it simply a situation where he got to the lead and he felt more comfortable there? Because he has run well from off the pace in the past. Yeah, I think that's the main your question is you know one of the things that concerned me about him dan is he took the big step forward last time but i thought he did it with the best trip in the race just the pace was not there um he was never they didn't have to go fast early in there and he just kicked away from twilight blue who we've already talked about was off a very long layoff in that spot i still thought this horse ran well i still thought he had potential like you did leading up to that race and he did break through last time Best actor, as Mike mentioned early on, has shown the ability to sit and finish and run well, as he did in the 2022 Indiana Derby, finishing second. He's very, very lightly raced. Last time out at Aqueduct, going a one-turn mile, he just had to win that race the way it was run. There was no pace going on. Best actor basically shook loose, but he did do some nice running, I thought, the final eighth of a mile.
I agree. He was in the right spot last time, but he really ran another good race. And he's just so lightly raced. And he was a good three-year-old, a graded stakes winner and graded stakes placed as a three-year-old, despite only making five starts. He's come back with three starts this year. He's improved with every one of those. And he can improve again here. I think he's super dangerous in this race. He just happened not to draw a great post. Uh, and if the number one is out, that means the 13 gasoline comes in for Todd Pletcher, who would set the tote board on fire if he does win this race because he's stepping up significantly. He, he is. I'm a little bit of a fan of this horse, but this might be a tough spot. Daily Racing Form YouTube channel is where you go. Please subscribe for the latest DRF videos. Top pick time for our Saturday race of the day the Fayette Stakes. Mike, you're going with King Fury. You've always been a fan of this horse. He's been pretty good to you throughout the years, and it looks like he's going to get a good setup. He should get the right setup here. Maybe he'll, he'll be able to take the step forward that he needs to take. I did think he ran deceptively well last time. Dan, I'm going to take him out of price. I like your top pick as well, uh, the 12 best actor. I put him second. Terrified of the trip he's going to get from out there because he's just got to hustle to get good position. I can't see them taking him all the way back to last. So a wide trip could be coming, but the price on the morning line is right for him, 10 to 1. 3, 12, 10, 11 for Mike, 12, 10, 1, 8 for me. It is our Saturday race of the day, the Fayette at Keeneland. Best of luck.